Welcome everyone to Sustainable Kashi's free permaculture class. We're really glad to have you all here and we're really happy to be able to host these classes to network together and share uh, techniques for a more regenerative and sustainable future. Uh, sustainable Kashi's happy to host these calls every week uh, to help us connect with our ecosystem and each other. Uh, we're located in Sebastian, Florida. We have an 80 acre intentional spiritual community here with nine different garden sites, each with different growing styles, an off-grid eco-village, uh, regenerative systems that you can really get your hands on and learn how they work. So we definitely invite you all to come out and check us out once we reopen after the COVID craziness. <laughs> so I wanna give a chance, everybody a chance to talk and uh, we're gonna be talking about food forests this week. So very exciting class, food forests. And why are we gonna talk about food forests? because we all love mangoes. Ooh, who doesn't love mangoes? So that's just one of the many foods we can grow. And I know uh, Matt is an expert. Oh, you don't like mangoes? <laughs> anyway, personally, the food forests uh, is one of the reasons I was drawn to permaculture. Um, I like to travel away for the summers to escape the Florida heat. And I'm usually gone for about three or four months out of the summers. And when I get back uh, from my, all my adventures and my exploring and teaching, the gardens look like pure chaos. All the annual gardens have weeds higher than me. Uh, I'm lucky to get a green a bell pepper or an or a eggplant out of them. And it's, it's, it's a struggle. But the perennial food forests I'm eating from on day one. I can make salads from the katuk trees. I have fruits. I have an abundance. And uh, I've learned to greatly appreciate those perennial forests for food productions. Um, now we have about 300 fruit trees here at Kashi and uh, it's, a, it's wonderful to watch them grow in their garden. So I'm very excited to have uh, to introduce Matt Reese today to teach with us on how to design these perennial systems. Uh, Matt's created whatsripening.com. I highly suggest everyone get to check that out. Uh, obviously it's really popular as we've hit our maximum number of participants on this call. So everyone that's here, welcome. Everyone who's not here will post the call to YouTube so you can watch it later. And uh, I'd really like to thank Matt for being here. So thank you, Matt, so much for being here and sharing what you know with us. All right, so yeah, thanks for everyone for listening in and thank you, Terry, for having me. Um, so the topic today is gonna be designing a food forest. And I'm approaching this um as a designer but i also want to give you as a personal you know as a practitioner yourself the ability to do this for yourself um so i'm going to kind of give it both ways and hopefully it'll apply to pretty much everybody here um as terry just said a perennial food forest is a pretty major element of a permaculture design and it is one of the more attractive, you know, one of the sexier elements that, that people see when they're introduced into permaculture is that food forest concept, the idea of having all the layers and having a perennial production and having things happening all the time. And um, I like to use the term, uh, <laughs> I call it my, my diversified plant folio. So, you know, with the food forest, I have things that I can grow and eat right away. I have things that are going to be there in a year, two years, 10 years. And um, depending on how you plan it out, you can even have uh, a timber crop or other, other long, long-term elements in the design and, um, and really make one area do a lot of different things. Um, so to me, food forestry, um, I consider it a land stewardship practice. And um, when, I, when I say practice, um, I'm kind of comparing it to like a, a medical practice or a law practice. It's something that you develop over time. Um, so if you're brand new to food forestry, um, don't expect to have all the answers, but you know, that's part of the fun. And um, make sure you're leaning on your, on your neighbors and other resources that you can, you can find out there. Um, other land stewardship practices, um, that are kind of related to food forestry, but you know, separate would be agroforestry. Um, there's silver, silver pasture, and then you have market gardening. Um, you have edible landscaping, which is one one of the people who was just asking about 
um, basically turning your landscape into an edible landscape. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum is, you know, lawn mowing and, and whatnot. So there's different ways to steward land. Food forestry is one of them. And um, it kind of bleeds into a bunch of other realms, but that's, that's what I consider to be food forestry is a land stewardship practice. Um, and what it is is a diverse planting that builds soil and produces something for the user. So those are the kind of the two elements to me. If, if you're building soil and you're producing something that you've decided you want to produce. Um, now the, the possibilities within a food forest are basically unlimited. I mean, you, you can do really anything you want. If you, have enough, if you have enough time and resources and passion and you know, all that kind of stuff, you can do just about anything um, within reason. And it is a process of learning and adapting and also of accepting. That's a big, a big piece of food forestry is accepting. I just said there's unlimited possibility, but there are gonna be limitations to every site. So your site might be small or your, you know, your weather might be too cold or too wet for certain things that you want to do. So accepting some of those limitations are going to help inform your design. Um, it's going to help a lot, actually. And one of the things that's daunting for me as a designer, when I, do, when I meet a person and they want to do everything, it doesn't give me, I need more focus. I, I, can't, I can't decide what to do until I've narrowed it down a little bit and taken some of the uh, unlimited possibility out of it. Um, some of the best resources for you, if you're, gonna, if you're learning or even as you develop your practice a little bit, is gonna be your local practitioners, other people that are in your area, in your climate, um, whether it be local to you or just, it could be another part of the world that just happens to have the same general environment. Um, those are the people that I would focus on. Um, when I first started here in Southwest Florida, I joined the local permaculture guild. Um, I went to the Florida permaculture convergences. I joined all the, uh, the local fruit tree club, like the rare fruit clubs, um, really good places to meet people that have been doing this for a long time. Usually you'll find older people in the rare fruit clubs and they have like, you know, I have a 35 year old Jabota Kaba tree in my yard and they, and they don't think of anything of it. And, and you're new to it thinking you have a 35 year old Jabota Kaba, you know, so you can, you can find people that you wouldn't have found on the internet, you know, in your local community, if you get kind of get out there. Um, online resources, um, this is kind of going into design element. Google Earth, um, you have the USDA soil survey, which you can use to find out about your soils for your site. You'd be surprised how much there could be variation through your site, or you'd be surprised what you can find on there. Um, there's the USGS uh, elevation maps the zone maps for USDA, and then um, for weather, the one that I like to use is called Meteo Blue, M-E-T-E-O Blue. That's a weather app, and you can get historical weather, and you can get that wind rose if you've ever seen it in the permaculture design. You know, what's my prevailing winds that coming from the north, or the west, or the south? You can kind of get all that stuff digitized, and you can print it out, and you can see it and relate it to your, to your site. Um, and then the other best res resource is going to be your own experience, your own observation, and what you learn along the way. That's, that's probably the most important thing. Um, so the design process is really, it's really a way of applying the stated intention um, based on observation and resources. So I'm going to go through kind of what all those things are in just a second, but, but you understand when, when the design process is that it's going to change. It's gonna change before you start, it's gonna change as you start, and it's gonna change as you go through the project. So, so don't be totally tied down to one thing. Let it, let it kind of flow as it goes, and um, it's gonna teach you as, you as you go. And I like to say that it's gonna be perfectly imperfect. So, so what, What you end up with in five years, you may have done it differently looking back, but, but you're gonna have a five-year-old food force. So you're, you're still gonna be ahead of the game um, just by having done something and, and, and learned, a lot, learned along the way. So I like to break up the food forest kind of development process into a couple different segments. The first one is the intention. So, you know, before we before I started, a couple of people kind of chimed in and were talking about their projects they're working on. And one of them, I thought was pretty interesting. They were talking about 
they're working with a church and they want to have a walking area and they want to have a planted area and they, and they really had a really pretty good baseline intention of who's this for um is it it's it's for the public or it's for the church group or it's for guests um, in your case it might be just for your own personal use uh, it might be for wildlife habitat restoration or whatever it is so knowing who the project's for is really important um, knowing what do you want the food forest to do or what are the goals of the food forest um, does it need to have an aesthetic appeal is it in your front yard and you need to fit in with your hoa or is it in your backyard or is it in the middle of the forest somewhere and you know it can be whatever you want it to be um, your goals might be to be a public resource it could be that it's a research project or a teaching project or you want to offer tours um, having that in mind before you start the project is going to help you make room for that like if you're going to lead a tour and you want to be able to stop in the middle of the food forest you probably need to leave an area in the middle of the food forest big enough to to host that size group um, i can tell you right now I've, I've done tours at my place quite a bit and at this point i don't like to have more than about 10 or 15 people at a time because they can't hear me first of all and second of all most of my corridors through the food forest areas are too narrow so i end up having to walk down the path stop and then walk back into the group so i can talk to everybody so everyone can hear me but having that in mind um, super helpful um, and then the other goals could be self-sufficiency. It could be financial. You know, I need to make a certain amount of money or I need to have product that I can access at a certain period of time, certain time of the year. Like Terry mentioned earlier, he likes to, he likes to leave Florida in the summer and come back. So for him, it might not make sense to plant a whole bunch of mango trees that are gonna be fruiting while he's gone, unless he has someone that's gonna steward the property and they're gonna benefit. Maybe that's, maybe that's the exchange you house it for me or you, you know, you watch over my stuff and you get all the mangoes. That's totally valid, you know, totally valid method for that. Um, next thing is looking at the scale of the project and the scale is going to inform um, how many, how much manpower you need, what kind of equipment you might need, the cost of the project, how long it's going to take to acquire all the materials. Um, and then that goes into the scope of the project. You know, are you going to be doing earthworks irrigation, or is it just going to be kind of lay it out, plant it, mulch it, and you know, and watch it grow? Um, so that's the intention, kind of knowing what you want to happen. And the next thing you want to do is apply that through your observation. So my goodness, I'm getting these messages. Um, Observation, first observation, most important is gonna be the land, the site that you're gonna use. So usually when I, when I go to a new site, the first thing I wanna see is what, what's already here. You know, is this a clear square pasture that's completely flat or is there a mountain here, is there a river? Um, so, so within the, the analysis of the land or, or property, you know, we, we like to start with water access structures, if you guys remember that from permaculture class. Um, water access structures, those are the kind of the top three that start with water. Is there water available, running water? Um, is there a stream or a pond? Um, is there standing water? Uh, all that kind of stuff definitely comes into play um, and it can inform, and inform your, uh, how you might place things in, within the landscape. The access is super important. This is one of the things that I'm, I'm probably more of a stickler on than most people um, is the access within to and within the food forest so if, if it's a small small forest in your backyard you just need walking paths it could be as wide as your shoulders or as wide as a wheelbarrow so you can get in and out you know harvesting or, or placing new mulch if you have a bigger system like like what i have at my place i have designed mine so that i can drive my tractor through at least some of the pathways i have like a main trunk pathway through some of my areas and then i have side things that are you know walking paths or whatever um and and you want to make the path wider than you think because everything actually grows in and eventually your path kind of disappears if you're not if you're not aware of it um especially if you're using a tractor so for me when i'm when i'm designing for a larger property i like to design 10 foot wide pathways which sounds humongous but if you can imagine this is a 10 foot wide path my tractor is five feet wide so it's only half the width of the path but if i'm going down the road 
my path and it turns, I have a loader bucket on the front of my tractor that's gonna stick out to the side. And when I turn, it's actually gonna be brushing against the side of all the trees on the one side of the path if I didn't make it wide enough. So I might be knocking all the mangoes off my tree as I'm, as I'm traveling through my property. Uh, so keeping that in mind. Uh, structures, I like structures are pretty hard to move. So you definitely wanna work around structures or also um, allow for structures. Like so, so for my property, I have a, I have a seven acre um, farm here in, in Southwest Florida. And we don't have a house. We're actually under construction now. But when we started the project, there was no house. Um, so my whole planting scheme was based around leaving a big gap in the middle because that's where the house might go. And so I planted the north end, the east end, kind of around the bottom, and then you know left that open. And it's still open now because we haven't finished the house. And once that's done, we'll close it in and be done with it but allowing for those structures, if you might have a gazebo or if you might have a, some kind of landing space or sitting space, allowing that, that to be within the design. And over, I always say oversize it a little bit because, because you'd be surprised. Believe it or not, when you plant things, they will grow. They actually get bigger than they were when you put them in the ground. Um, next thing to consider is the soils. So most, if you're in Florida, like if you're like where I'm at, it's just sand, there's no fertility at all. And most, most places don't have as much fertility as they would like. So you, you're, gonna, you're going to be building your soil anyway, but it's nice to kind of see what you have. If it's clay or sand or how, how it holds water and all that kind of stuff. Um, you wanna look at the existing vegetation. Is it covered in Brazilian peppers? Um, is, it, is it there were super, super high wildlife pressure? You know, are you gonna have things coming in and just eating everything you plant? You know, I've had times where, I went through and planted all these perennial vegetables and like by the time I was at the end of the row I'm pretty sure rabbits were over here like chewing chewing things down as I was planting them you might have pigs that come in and dig up the roots or whatever um, but you could also have existing vegetation that's of a benefit so you might have a, a nice oak canopy that that there's plenty of space underneath to have an understory planting and that can canopy could be protective and uh, of some benefit to you and there might be product, productive systems that are already there. You might have, maybe there's a ditch bank that's full of elderberries and you know, for you to take those out would, would kind, of be, kind of be silly unless there's a particular reason to do so. You might have something that's already there that's an asset to your project. Um, so within the observations, you have the land, which we just talked about. The next thing would be the team. It's important to know who's in charge, who's gonna be operating and who's gonna be doing the work. Um, and those aren't necessarily the same person. They could be, if, if it's a small project, they could, you could be the one-man band and do the whole thing yourself. Um, it's totally fine. The, I always say the best designer for a site like this, for a food forest, is the, is the user. That's the ideal designer because, as we said, the, the design process is never really finished. And the person that's using is going to be getting the most information to adjust the design as they go. So I, you know, I do encourage you if, you, if you need help, to hire a professional and, and her at least get some advice. Um, you can, like, like someone like me, I do consultation service for people, and which is basically I come to the site, I spend a couple hours with you. You ask me every question you possibly have. I give you my best answer, and I also kind of guide you through what I think would be your next best step and how to, how to organize and how to, how to move forward with your project. Totally fine. And, but, but, but at the end of the day, you're the designer because it's still, I'm putting this tree because this is what I want and I have, you know, my own criteria that's gonna develop as I, as I move forward. Um, and then the last thing, part of the team, I consider part of the team is the equipment. I mentioned that a little bit before with the tractor. Borrow it, rent it. Um, if you don't have to purchase it, don't. But most projects, if you get to it, once you get to a certain size, it, it's you would be shocked at how much you can get done with a, a one-day rental of a small bobcat or borrowing your neighbor's tractor or something it's shocking i i went for two years on my farm without equipment and i had to you know i basically stockpile wood chips and then i go rent the bobcat for the day and then run it all day long and you can get a ton done and then the next level is when you get to a certain you have a certain size property i would say two acres or more of actual managed food forest, you might consider having a tractor so you can move mulch um, if, you can, if you can budget for it or, or 
even better is if you can borrow your neighbor's tractor or like kind of co-own it with somebody. But I like to say the tractor makes a man into 10 men or a one, you know, person into 10, 10 persons. Um, you really can do a lot with that equipment and, um, and free, your, free your time up to do other things, to do other creative ventures or do more food for us for other people or whatever it is. So it's, it's a powerful tool. Um, another observation would be the broader community. Um, what kind of demand is there out there? You know, do you want to have a certain type of produce or medicine or whatever plants that you want to pull out of your food forest? This can all help you with your design if that's what you want to do. Um, and then where are these people? Are, do they walk by your property or do they have to come to you or are you going to go to them? You know, it's all part of, the, part, of the, part of the process. And then also your access to materials. You know, are you going to be able to get wood chips to your site? Um, do you have to pay for it? Is it free? Um, maybe you have a pasture that you can, you can harvest hay seasonally and you'll be able to have that to sheet mulch or you have your own wood chipper or, you know, can you, what, what kind of material can you get? That's going to inform how big of an area that you can work on at a time. So it may be that you have, you might have a half an acre of property that you want to food for us, but you'd be better off starting with a small area and doing it really, really well when you have enough material. And then as you bank up more material, you just grow that out and you, and you kind of piecemeal it along. Um, that's what I would generally recommend. It's not what most people want to hear. Most people want to get everything in right now because it's a, it's a big rush to have everything um, put in, but it may not always work out that way. Uh, let's see. So the next thing would be preparation. So I kind of touched on it already a little bit, but you, you need to find a starting point within the design. So let's say you have your, your food forest design, you're gonna, you're gonna food forest the whole backyard. You've got the back, the back of the house, and then you've got a certain distance to the, to the fence in the backyard, and you have a corridor through that you're gonna maintain as an open pathway. So you can either start on the back side of the corridor or the side that's closer to your house. You basically need to pick somewhere to start. And I like to, I like to do it around a feature. Like it could be the downspout off of your roof. That might be somewhere where you put a banana circle and that, and that banana circle becomes kind of like the nucleus of that part of the food forest and you grow out from there. Um, it could be based on an edge, you know, like the edge of an existing canopy, an existing forest. Um, I've done that quite a bit at my place where I had a lot of open pasture, but I had a few areas where there was um, large weed trees or oak trees just kind of in the middle. Um, and what I did was cleaned out underneath the main tree, and then I started my bed out from the main tree. So that, 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 that tree that's already there was, was the mother, and I kind of just extended it out. And then I had another tree over here that I extended out, and eventually the, the beds connected. But having somewhere to start is really helpful. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and, excuse <clears throat> me. And yeah, so I, I really liked, I liked the idea of extending the edge because if you remember in, in your permaculture course, the edge is where all the activity is. That's where all the, there's a lot of dynamics that go on. The edge of the forest, the edge of the water, the edge of any kind of major feature, you're going to have interactions that are uncommon to like the middle of the forest or the middle of the field. So if you can extend your edge and, and even elongate your edges, um, that can be pretty, pretty interesting within the design. Um, and I'm going to talk about edges again later on and I have a couple other things that, that apply to that. So if I forget, someone, someone chime in and remind me. Um, so how to organize your project. Before you, before you buy your plants and put your plants in, Usually there's something that needs to be done to prepare the area. Um, this might be running an irrigation line to the area. Maybe it's just a hose bib, or maybe you're actually gonna put irrigation onto your trees. Um, it may be if, you have, if, you're, if your area is really wet, you might have to bring in a little bit of material to mound up so that you can plant a more of a diverse selection of fruit trees. 
Um, and there's other heavy duty kind of projects like limbing big, ex big trees that are already there. Like, like I said, if you have a mother tree that you're gonna plant around, you might wanna limb some of that up or thin the canopy so that that tree's not so uh, vulnerable to the wind or, or the weather where it might snap and break and smash and land on, <laughs> land on your new baby trees. So having some of that stuff done ahead of time before you come in and start doing your, your installations really important and it's often overlooked so keep that in mind um, that type of work that I, I consider those heavy heavy projects infrastructure earthworks um, limbing cutting down trees that kind of stuff i consider that heavy work and if i have the opportunity i prefer to push the heavy work into the cooler months um, so if you are thinking about this from a long-term management approach Usually in the summer is when I am planting and pruning. The summer is rainy season, it's basically the same thing here. You might be in a different zone, you have a different situation, but for me when it's wet and hot, I don't want to be outside all day, you know, busting my hump trying to, trying to get things done. I want to have things planted. If it's a new planting, I'm planting. Otherwise, I'm harvesting and pruning for the summer and I'm observing. And so what I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm observing is planning what I'm going to do when it cools down. And then when it cools down, that's when I do my heavy work, um, which would include the infrastructure and, you know, tree removal or whatever it may be. Um, so you'll start, you'll start to develop a seasonal pattern. And it starts, a dip, it, it's a little different at the beginning than it is as you kind of work your way through. But, but you'll see how it goes when, once you get into it. Um, so the next thing <clears throat> to decide is basically what stays and what goes. Are you going to need to remove grass or vegetation or, like I said earlier, prune that canopy? Um, it's preparing your site, basically. Um, once you have kind of the heavy work done, the, the main, the big stuff done, you're going to start gathering your resources. And depending on the size of your project, you may need to start weeks ahead of time or you might, you know, go down to the place and buy some compost that morning and, and then you can start. Um, so you, you can kind of like stage things out, how, how the project's gonna go based on the size of the project. Um, a lot of times for larger clients that I work with, um, we set up a temporary nursery. So we might buy a roll of that black mat that you see in nurseries, roll it out, put a sprinkler next to it, put all the plants out. Um, depending on the size of the plants, we might even stake them up with, with, uh, with posts and string keep them irrigated and have them on site so that when everything's ready, we can go ahead and put them in. Um, one thing that's a little irritating is to have to be started and then not have everything that you need and have to go back and find everything. So kind of having a little staging area for your plants and also for your mulch nearby that you can actually push it over to pretty quickly. Um, pretty important. Third thing, is the uh, the rough layout so for me with rough layout what i like to do <clears throat> usually what i'm trying to define is the edges of the food forest if you have hard edges you might not have hard edges it might just you know kind of dis disperse into a natural setting but most of the time especially if you're doing it like an edible landscape or more aesthetic you know it's a park or if it's it's for people to see you want to have defined edges and so when I'm doing my rough layout, I'm defining my edges and then I'm defining my main species. So to define the edges, what I like to use, for smaller sites, I'll use pieces of rope or maybe garden hose and I'll actually lay them out on the property and, and kind of create the curves that I want to see. I want to see that swooping line or, or maybe it's a hard line, you know, however, however you want it to be, to be able to visualize it on site. Um, if it's a bigger project, um, what we use is that marker paint you see the surveyors use when they're when they're marking out the uh, the utilities. Um, it's a biodegradable paint. It comes in different colors, and you can get a little paint gun that you can walk along and and spray the lines. That's really helpful, especially if you're doing um, like I have a project that I'm starting next week, and we 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 created an agroforestry system, but he wanted sweeping. He wanted the tree lines to be sweeping. And so what I did was I created arcs. I have a central point, like here's a central point, and I just, I pull a string line, 
you know, this is the string line and I have my paint gun and I just painted the lines on the, on the ground based off of that one center point. So I did that and then I measured out another 20 feet and did the other side. And um, having the paint and the string, you can, you can actually get really nice consistent lines if you wanna do it that way. And then for, for staking out or laying out the trees, if it's just for a short term, I'll use the little flags you can get at Home Depot, you can get different colors. You know, use orange ones for the main trees, yellow ones for the secondary trees, green ones for the little other stuff. Really, it's just the main primary and secondary fruit trees are usually the only thing I really worry about laying out. If it's going to be long term, like if you're, if you're laying out and you have a big area that you have to plant, what I like to use, and this is, this is one of my little pro tips that I learned from surveying, you go into the hardware store or the, you know Home Depot or Lowe's and look at electrical conduit. They make, they come in 10 foot sections. You can get them like, I think it's like a three quarter or an inch diameter electrical conduit. They make them in 10 foot sections, but they also make them in five. So you can buy the tens and cut them in half or you can buy the five foot sections. Those make really durable stakes. And you can use them for marking things. You can tie a little piece of flagging onto it so you, you can see it and you can reuse it. And that's why I like to use those. We, we can re reuse them quite a bit. Um, you'll need one of those fence post pounders. Um, you can also get those at Home Depot. And that's what I do for, for professional work. When I'm planting out a big area, I'll, I'll actually go and, and that'll be part of the budget is, is buying a bunch of stakes, pound them in, put the little flag on them. You can even write on, you can write, this is mango. You know, you can make mango, avocado, whatever is on, on the side with a Sharpie marker. And they'll last. I've had them sit out for a year. They'll, they'll be fine. Um, and those are really helpful. The little flags are great for a short term, but that little plastic thing will it'll fly off eventually when the rain and the wind are hitting it. And then it's really hard to find that one little metal stick that's sticking out of the ground versus a, a big stake with some flagging on top of it. <coughs> so that's the rough layout. Um, and then you always have to remember the access when you're laying it out. You're going to be putting out your, your main fruit trees, but it's probably just as, as well, like I said, you want to delineate your edge, but just as well to have something to delineate the midline of your path and then walk down the path. Maybe you stick your arms out both ways and just look at how, when you walk through your pathway, you know, how, how long is it going to take before I'm touching both of these trees on, on both sides? Or are, am I ever going to touch them? Or are they already, you know, over my head? Um, that's something they consider and and depending on your style with the trees you can let them grow taller and you can walk underneath them obviously you can do that too um maintain the trees is another whole another whole uh thing to talk about um so so this goes into the the next step is going to be your planting once you have everything laid out i always start with the main long-term fruit trees um to me these are your investment this is the thing that if you're going to spend, I would spend on your main trees. I think it's, personally, I think it's fully worth it to go buy a grafted tree um, so you know what you're going to get, especially if you don't have a lot of space. You know, don't waste your space on, on maybes. Like, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of fruit trees, like, for instance, the black sapote, chocolate pudding fruit. Chocolate pudding fruit is dioecious, meaning that, the, the, that seed will germinate and become a tree and the tree will make either male flowers or female flowers. <clears throat> and you won't know that for seven or eight years. If it makes the male flower, you'll never get a fruit. So you could spend seven or eight years to wait for it to flower. And then it, then you find out, Oh, that's the wrong kind. I should have, oops, I should, I should have, I wish that was a female. But if you buy a grafted tree, it's going to be a female and you're going to get fruit in, a couple of years instead of you know seven or eight years so when you consider your investment in your trees you're basically buying time and you're buying some and it's kind of like insurance you know I'm, i know what i'm gonna get and i can get it a lot sooner you know which is that's kind of the, where we are in today's society we want things now and we want to know what we're going to get um there is a fully valid anti-argument to that you know, plant seeds and I want to, I want a new genetics and I want to try something else. If that's what you want to do, by all means, don't let me talk you out of it. Do it. Um, but the first thing is you're going to put those main species in. 
you want to consider the mature size. I've kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, the mature size for you might be different from me, and it might be different based on the actual variety. So within mangoes, for instance, I have, at my farm, I have 60 varieties of mangoes. <clears throat> and I have some species in there that are obviously dwarf. I have one that's four years old, and it, it's not even, it probably comes up to my belly button. And it flowers every year, and it's fruiting right now, but it just doesn't grow. So it's mature size. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be really easy to keep it small if I want to. I have other ones. When they put new growth out, the stems start out thicker than my thumb, and they're elongated and just huge leaves, and those trees are going to be monsters, and I'm going to have to figure out how to, how to manage them because I have all my trees are spaced the same way. Because the intention of my grove is that I am doing my research. I'm trying to figure out, I'm evaluating these different um, cultivars for Southwest Florida so that I can, when I have my nursery set up, I can offer the best of the best for our area and, and I'll be the most informed guy and I'll have the fruit, try the fruit, you like it, here's the tree. You know, that's, that's kind of the thing I'm going for. But keeping in mind the mature size and also the pruning style, um, it really is beneficial to prune your fruit trees. Um, I know a lot of people tend to want to let things be natural and go the way they want to go. That's totally fine. What's going to happen with that is that you're going to, you're going to lose the density. You're going to, you're going to have one tree that takes over and then everything else is going to probably have to take second position or, you know, things will grow into each other and then they won't, you won't have enough sunlight to get, to get fruit set. Um, once you have the main species put in, and I like to say, me personally, I like to put the main species anywhere from 10 to 20 feet apart. Um, my preference was, would be on the closer to 20, like 15 to 20 would be better. Um, when you do that, you give yourself time. So 15 feet spacing, that's what I did for my mangoes, 15 feet spacing. When I plant a tree, I have about five years, give or take, before my trees start touching each other, before the next canopy comes in and touches. That's five years. So in five years, I'm waiting for those mango trees to grow, and they're not even producing fruit the first one or two or however years. And then once they start, they kind of start slow and they build up to maturity. I have five years. So what I've done with my place is interplanted in between my mangoes with bananas. And I've been fruiting the heck out of bananas in my mango orchard. It's a mango orchard, but it's really a banana orchard right now. Um, and so you've got space. If you, if you plant your main trees far enough apart, you have space for things like bananas, papayas, moringas. And where you are may be different. You might have different species that apply for you. But things that are shorter term, that will provide a quicker return, and maybe they're easier to propagate, and they're something that you could pull out later if you want to. Um, those shorter term species are going to be what, depending on your, on your needs, for me, financially, I've made my investment back already on my bananas. My bananas have paid for all the plants I've planted at my place. So before I even start to sell or to produce mangoes, which I already have started that, I've already, by the time I've sold pups, and sold fruit and made dried fruit and made frozen fruit and you know the, all this banana all these banana products that I could come up with in the first two years I've easily paid for everything that I've invested in this as far as plant material maybe not I haven't paid for my tractor but you know you can get a lot of stuff out of that those early crops so you got your main species main species then you got your your secondary and it, it doesn't have to be within the line it can be however you want it to be. Just make sure they have enough room within each other. And then the, other, the next thing you want to do is overstack with service plant. And service plants, to me, that's biomass. That's, uh, they're cheap and easy to propagate. And if they don't make it, it's okay. That's why you overstack them. So something like a pigeon pea, you know, once you have, if you can get your hands on some pigeon pea seeds or some moringa seeds, or some cassava cuttings or pigeon pea, not pigeon pea, uh, 
Mexican sunflower or something like that. If you know somebody that has it, you can, you can get it basically for free or for very, very cheap. Stick them in everywhere, and then you have all kinds of options. You can always cut them back, but, you, but in the meantime, you have all this biomass coming up where you can place it around your trees. <laughs> so whether you put those service plants in at the same time as everything else or you put it in afterwards is something I'm going to talk about right now. Um, so when we, do, when we do larger food forest projects and we do a big sheet mulching, which is which was one of our main establishment strategies is to, to bring in at least six inches of wood chips. I like, at my farm, I did almost a foot through most of my beds. And so when you do it that way, what you're allowing for is, you know, I'm going to plant my main trees and maybe my secondary trees, but I'm going to have a lot of open space. And that makes it a lot easier to place mulch thickly. Um, having that thick mulch makes it difficult to plant into. So if you want your food forest to look like a jungle right away, you may not mulch as thick. It may be better for you to plant more species and use less mulch. Um, the way that I like to do it based on, like for instance, at my farm, I don't have time to be there all the time because right now I don't live at my farm. I have to commute back and forth. So I need to keep the maintenance low. So what I did was I put in my main species and my secondary species. I mulched really thick. And basically, I'm just investing. This is, this is going to turn into beautiful topsoil. And if you watch my YouTube videos, was, oh, shoot, I'm getting a five-minute warning. Hang on. Let me see how far i got to get. Oh, no, I'm doing pretty good. Okay. Um, so you can do it with a thick mulch and just have primary, secondary, and maybe a few service plants. Or you can do thinner mulch, and then you can really pop in tons of seeds and, and things like that. Another little hack that I've done before is if I do mulch heavy and I want to have a little bit of diversity in there, what I'll do is pull the mulch back. And then um, like locally, I can buy this stuff called planting mix. It's a composted wood mulch. I can go buy it by the yard. I'll get like a three gallon pot and like dump it into this hole in the mulch and plant something in there. And I'll do, and I'll just cover back up with mulch and I'll do, I'll do that and have like little, little fertility islands to get things established. Um, that really helps. Um, I'm going to try to move forward. So I, I wanted to go through some of my lessons learned. And I've kind of talked about a couple of them, but I want to kind of give you guys a little bit of encouragement and some lessons learned from my own personal experience. Number one is planting too close. I did this at my house. I planted mango tree, mango tree, and then I got really smart and put a sugar apple right in between them. And guess what? That sugar apple had the had, basically, when you, when you plant your main species too close together, you have to make tough decisions down the line. You'd be better off to keep the main species away and do secondary species in between. So if you want them to be close, do something that's, that's not such a long-term species. So you have that succession in mind. Um, another thing that I did at my place, because my place does get wet in the, in the uh, summertime, is I mounded things too high. I looked at the uh, University of Florida website and they said, oh, one to three foot tall mound, 10 feet wide or whatever. And I got really scared that I was going to kill all my trees because they were too wet. And so I made these huge mounds. And what I found is when you make a really tall mound, it's almost impossible to keep any water, any moisture in that soil, that top layer of soil. So the places where I've done my highest mounds, I've planted the trees. There's some of my oldest trees. There's some of my smallest trees because they haven't been able to get their roots really down and established. And so mounting too high, that's another lesson learned. I would try to go the middle path, try to, try to moderate. And so what you're gonna do is keep your mounds shorter. So for me, I think about a, a one foot is about a maximum height on a mound. And then also be more careful with your species selection. So I was trying to, I wanted to have everything. So that's why I was putting in these mounds because a lot of trees don't like the wet feet. Now I'm at the point where I'm really more selective of what will fit my site instead of what I want. Because I can, you know, like for instance, avocados, I can go buy or trade for avocados. I, maybe I'm not growing avocados, but I can be the banana guy. I can be the, the mango guy or the coconut guy. And somebody else can be the avocado person. You know, great. That's fine. I don't have to have, in, in my opinion, I don't have to have everything. 
because my property doesn't allow for it. You know, those are some of the limitations I have. Um, another one is not maintaining pruning. And this is uh, for your productive species and for your service plants. Don't be afraid to prune those things. You'll, you'll be shocked. Like I'll give Mexican sunflower as an example. If you've ever seen it planted and just left alone, it's a really kind of a sad looking plant. It'll get woody and thin and the leaves will all fall off. If you maintain it, it like bursts with life. It's just blowing out green, green uh, material all the time. It's, it makes a big difference. Um, let's see, I already talked about picking the wrong plant. I've already been through that a little bit. Um, another one is listening to parrots. And this is, this is not meant to be an insult, but listening to people that aren't practicing food forestry. So if someone tells you, oh, this is something I heard about from somewhere or online or something, that's not their real, that's not their knowledge. That's something that they're parroting. They're, they're giving you something they heard. The, the advice you want is from people that know what they're talking about because they did it themselves or they're at least relating something they've done. Um, so I did that initially was listening to people that I thought knew more than me or knew better. And what I realized later was that they were just repeating something that I could have looked up on the internet too. So try to be mindful of who your information is coming from or where or how it's, be, how it's getting to you. Um, common mistakes. Biggest one I see people that ask me in a consultation or just in general asking me questions about food forests and permaculture is this fear of failure and not starting. Um, I've said a lot of stuff about getting prepared and understanding the whole thing. I don't want that to stop you from starting. Um, that's why I said earlier, find a place to start, even if it's in the back corner, and at least get something happening because it's going to be encouraging and you're going to learn from it, even if, it, even if you've made a mistake. You know, it's, it's okay. Do something. Get, get something. Get something started. Next common mistake is too many projects. You know, I'm, I'm starting my annual garden. I'm also doing my food forest and I'm building this and I'm house building. And I'm, now I'm, I'm getting chickens next week. Those are all great things to do. I would rather see you do one of them really well than to try to do all of them at the same time. So you get stressed out. At least I do. If I have, if I bring in too many projects at the same time, I get stressed out. It's just not worth it. Next one is being a collector. Try, you know, it's really tempting when you first start to be a collector and I want to have every single fruit tree that was ever there and I want to have them all. What I would recommend is to really focus on what you will actually eat and what really wants to grow in your environment. Um, it sounds obvious and it kind of is, but, but we all get excited and we miss it. And um, you'll end up planting a bunch of stuff and you'll look back and go, oh, okay, well, that's not a very productive plant or I don't really like it anymore. Um, another one that I see that's a common mistake is the, is the disdain for appropriate technology like a tractor. Um, if you're doing a certain size parcel, really consider using a tractor or some type of equipment. Don't underestimate the power of something that runs on fossil fuel. It, I'm telling you, you can get so much done, it'll, it'll blow you away. Um, next one is underestimating the growth. Like I said, putting your trees too close where they grow under each other. And then what you end up with is canopies that, that touch. When you have the canopies touching, the sun can't reach either one. And so those parts of the tree don't fruit generally. And so you'll have a whole bunch of wood and leaves and you won't have that much fruit. So you want, you're either gonna have to prune or have them kind of further apart in the, in the beginning. And the other one is impatience. You know, this stuff takes time. Be patient with yourself, be patient with your plants. If something doesn't look right, a lot of times it's gonna look better if you just wait a little bit. Like if you just plant it and it's kind of, you know, it's, it's wilting or whatever, just give it a minute. Don't, don't worry about it. Let, it. let it do what it's gonna do. Um, I've had trees that I, that I planted and didn't, didn't move a muscle for two years and then now they're now suddenly they're all blowing out with new growth and I was actually I had two uh, white spotted in my in my property that I was actually going to dig up like this week <clears throat> I walked by the trees today or yesterday and they're full of new growth and they had I mean literally haven't done anything one of them has been there for four years and it's grown about this much and then in the last four days it's, it's grown this much so some 
Impatience is another one. Um, that pretty much wraps it up for what I had prepared. So I want to see if we can go into questions. And I don't know how to do that, but um, Matt, this your class is an abundance of knowledge. Thank you for sharing <laughs> everything with us. I know that you've gone through a lot of those bumps and and uh, hard lessons learned. And uh, so I know you've gone through it and I've heard just amazing things about the, uh, your mango collection in particular. <laughs> so um, I really want to thank you a lot. And um, uh, is, how can people get in touch with you? Like, what's the easiest way? Um, I'm on Facebook. I have that group, What's Ripening Florida, is a pretty easy public way. Um, if you want to private message me through Facebook or Instagram, you can. What's Ripening is my Instagram. Or... Um, I have my website, what's ripening.com. There's an email link on the website if you want to contact me through email. Excellent, excellent. So we have um, probably like a dozen questions, and I want to direct those to the Facebook community class because uh, we're going to, it's they're hard to answer in this format. So Amy will post all that information right in the chat box of how to get there, uh, and we can all meet there. But I really want to thank you so much just for being here and dedicating your time and all of that. Um, I also want to thank you for donating that 30 minute phone consult or surprise tropical fruit package that uh, you've donated as a prize this week, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be eligible to win that prize, just go into the community and uh, that's on Facebook and just tell us what your biggest takeaway from the class was today. And uh, you'll automatically be entered to win that prize from Matt, which I might enter it to win that 30 minute consult from you. So that's uh, and not to mention the fruit package. Uh, so thank you so much. It's, uh, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful topic. Uh, thank you, Amy Zelt, for running the production. She's, uh, we kept her busy today, so uh, we really owe her for the smoothness of this call. Um, if you feel like you've gotten some out of this, feel free to donate to us. Uh, it's what keeps us going. We have uh, the links all next into the comment uh, section. Uh, Laura Oldane will be our speaker next week. She's going to be talking with us about financial permaculture, and that's just uh, a wonderful topic, uh, especially in this time. Uh, Jeff Lawton said you can solve all the world's problems in a garden, and uh, this concept really demonstrates the perfection of nature. As we observe the per perfection of the forest, we can imitate that in our lives and really learn how to nurture and protect each other in this interconnected, abundant future. So thank you all for joining us on this important topic and we look forward to seeing you next week and we look forward to answering all your questions in the Facebook community page. Bye. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>